very warm welcome to everyone, and especially to Paul Krugman, our lecturer this evening. Paul's been described in glowing terms by many ever since he had that huge impact on the profession with his first published research papers. I remember my professors at LSE, when I was a student here, describing him as the clever boy when he was still a PhD student at MIT. That's when his reputation began. More recently, he's been rightly described as the most influential economist of his generation, and he's currently a professor at Princeton University. Paul's important con contributions to modern trade theory and economic geography, which date back to his PhD, earned him the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2008. More recently, he has focused his research to more applied economic problems. He became a renowned columnist and blogger for the New York Times, and his views have given a lot of publicity in the media. And tonight, he will talk to us about the thesis in his latest book, End This Dep Depression Now. The lecture will be accompanied by Twitter with hashtag hash LSE Krugman, and it's being recorded. It will be made available in, podca in podcast, these new words, I just can't say them in the podcast, <laughs> on the LSE website. And after the lecture, Paul will be available to sign copies of his book in the foyer. And don't worry if you don't have the book, there will be a book sale as well in the foyer. The lecture will last approximately 45 minutes. There will be as much time for questions after that, so do think of any questions as we move along. And I'd like to welcome Paul now to come to deliver his lecture. Thanks. Right. There we go. Full screen mode. Thank you. Um, well, it's rather a large lecture, and I'm rather a short person, so. Look at you over here. Well, thanks, thanks, Chris. Um, I guess I guess some people have said some glowing things. On the other hand, I saw that just before coming, the uh, the Telegraph uh, ran an article saying that I was a, a false messiah with sat satanic intent. So uh, so if you if you smell brimstone, I guess that's what's happening here. Um, okay. Um, so I am here actually for a variety of reasons, but obviously I do have a. That is not supposed to be happening, folks. Is there a way to make that go away? There, not? Well, we're getting there. There we go. Uh, I have a book with this title, and this depression now, um, which is a, a term I'm using advisedly. Some, some people say, why, why depression? Why is this, uh, uh, isn't that a bit extreme? Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a term I'm using quite deliberately um, and not only uh, to get people's attention and sell books, though that can't hurt, but, uh, but because I think we do need a better term than what we've been using a lot. People have been talking about, uh, about the Great Recession. Uh, but a recession, we more or less have an official definition of recession. Uh, strictly speaking, in, in the United States, a recession is a period that is designated as a recession by the Recession Dating Committee, but, uh, but in, by and large, recession means something like two quarters of declining GDP, or in general, a recession is a period when things are heading down. Um, a depression, um, at least as I would define it, is a period when things are down. So that what we call the Great Depression is an extended period, more than a decade, uh, which includes within it periods of both recession and recovery, but the recoveries were never enough to remotely uh, recover the ground lost in, in, uh, in the recessions. So it was a long period of high unemployment, uh, mass misery, poor economic performance, um, which is what we're going through now. It's, uh, it's not as bad as the Great Depression, um, at least in the United States. Uh, I've been suggesting that as a re-election slogan for President Obama. Not as bad as the Great Depression. Um, uh, by some measures, as you probably know, actually here it is. Uh, that is the... Uh, uh, the, 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 the length of the output slump has actually got, been longer here than it, uh, this time around than during the 1930s, though obviously the, the levels of misery are incomparable, but it is plenty bad. Um, and just to give you an indication of, of you know, 
Why, why is this slump different from any other slump or something along those lines? This is just um, the US numbers. I, I should say that, that uh, the book is, is uh, oriented initially towards an American audience. And, uh, and, it is, uh, and much of what I'll show you now is going to be US data, though not all. Um, and I was actually thinking for this about how do I, how do I talk to a UK audience? And, and part, of, part of the answer is, look, uh, I think uh, what's, what's going on in my country is of interest. Uh, partly, and obviously, but also what's going on here is of interest. But also, there's, there's a lot of similarity. And so partly the way I'll do this, given it is to, is to talk about US things and talk about how similar, in many ways, the UK situation actually looks um, with, of course, different, very different policy rhetoric and somewhat different policy response. But anyway, this is our US picture. Um, from, uh, from Pew, the... the uh, um, so unemployment. We've, we have had periods, if, if you look, that, that uh, slump in the, uh, in the early 1980s uh, was the, uh, the, the peak unemployment rate was actually somewhat higher than the peak unemployment rate now. Um, uh, and uh, uh, certainly for quite some time it was uh, substantially, I'm seeing that flicker up there. So I, I hope that we don't have any problems from that. But anyway, um, so in, in some ways you might on a first glance say, well, you know, is this really that much worse than what happened in the 80s? Um, the, part of the answer is it's gone on longer, but uh, that what that really translates into above all is, in the United States, is long-term unemployment. Uh, the United States normally has very little long-term unemployment. Uh, only a few hundred thousand people who have been out of work for a year or more. Um, and uh, part of our problem, of course, is our whole social uh, safety net, such as it is, is designed around the notion that people are not going to be out of work for really extended periods of time. Well. Uh, gosh. Uh, I wonder if there's a, uh, is there a fix for that any place? Thank you. Uh, yes. Well, I was going to say, actually, that in the end, that, you know, that, that a depression is basically a narrow technical problem. So maybe having a narrow technical problem is a good way to, to start our, our, okay. Um, uh, yeah. Um, it's, it's unprecedented, at least since the 1930s. Uh, not simply that we have a lot of people unemployed and a lot of people underemployed and a lot of people who are not counted as unemployed because they've dropped out of the, uh, they're no longer actively searching because there are no jobs to be found, but the fact that, um, that, that it's really, really hard to, to find a job if you lose one, which is nothing like what we've seen before. And it's and very, very little sign of improvement. Some things are a little bit better. So we've gone... Uh, in the U.S. from uh, almost five job seekers for every vacancy to a little over three, but that's still terrible. It's still a, a, a really, really uh, awful situation um, with no quick end in sight. Um, the, uh, this is not supposed to happen. This was not supposed to be in the range of things that was supposed to happen. If we, if we think about various things that one thought might go wrong in the 21st century economy. Um, we certainly had in mind the possibility of disruptions to oil supply, once again, from political events in the Middle East. Uh, we, we talked about uh, perhaps exotic new things that might come out of excessive or reliance on information technology, uh, all kinds of things, scenarios, environmental catastrophe. Um, but the idea that what we would have would be something that was recognizably a close cousin to the Great Depression of the 1930s, something that looked very, very much like the, great, the 1930s, something where you can, you can take passages written by John Maynard Keynes or Irving Fisher and, um, aside from a few archaic turns of phrase, read like they were written about the economy today. That was not supposed to happen, um, and yet it has. And we have found ourselves in something which is very much... Um, in a, almost, you might say, a classic depression, which, as I say, is not supposed to happen partly because we thought that there were safeguards against this sort of thing, but partly because we thought that we had learned something. We thought that economists and policymakers had learned enough lessons that nothing like the Great Depression could ever happen again. And what has happened, it turns out, is that um, the policy response has been abysmal. 
that we've had disastrously failed policies uh, all through the advanced world. I should say this is uh, this depression. Uh, it's largely I, I, I would call it a, a North Atlantic crisis. That is, it's a uh, it's something that's it's mostly taking place uh, in the United States and in Europe, um, with Japan caught up in it, but Japan, in a way, was, has been there for a while. So Japan basically did a full, a full dress rehearsal for this in, in the 1990s and, and never stopped. And now, now the rest of us have all in the same situation. Uh, actually, uh, one line you may have seen, I, I did the, uh, the talk with, with Martin Wolf, the FT, which I've been using a bit, is that, that given the way we've responded to the crisis, um, we, a lot of us were very, very critical 10, 12 years ago of Japan's response to its problems. Um, but given how badly we've responded, the Japanese response actually looks not so bad by comparison. Uh, the, the Japan is, instead of being a cautionary tale, is almost starting to look like a role model. Um, and, uh, and I've been suggesting that, uh, so I'm going to do lots of little diversions here. There, there was actually a group of Japan warriors at Princeton when I first got there in 2000. A whole, whole group of people who were all looked at the Japanese example found it deeply concerning both as a question of economic theory and as a possible omen, because in the end, if that could happen to one advanced country with a stable government with, uh, and with, with public officials who, while not optimal, were not idiots, then it could happen to the rest of us. And the little group of Japan warriors that was me, all, all dispersed at this point, by the way, me, still at Princeton, but Lars Svensson, who's now at the Riksbank in Sweden, um, Mike Woodford, great macro theorist, though not a household name, moved off to Columbia, and the, what's the fourth guy's name? Bernanke, Ben Bernanke. Don't know what happened to him. Um, I've been suggesting that we should all actually go to Tokyo as, in a group and apologize to the emperor, uh, because, because we've done worse, actually, than they ever did in responding to this crisis. Um, now, in that response, um, and here's where at least I can at least somewhat localize this. Uh, um, we've all responded disastrously in terms of policy. The, uh, the Eurozone has responded disastrously. The United States has responded disastrously. Um, the UK has a kind of a special role in all of this because um, its disastrous response, I think, is uniquely unforced. There's, there's a sort of arbitrariness to the UK error that isn't, uh, isn't, isn't the same. The Eurozone has a deep structural problem in the fact that it has a single currency without a single government. And that has, has turned out to make it very, very difficult to cope. Uh, the United States has a deep structural problem, which is that one of our two major political parties is completely insane. Um, <laughs> um, um, Britain does not. The UK has a uh, uh, relative, uh, certainly, I mean, certainly, um, Lots of things to disagree with, but not that kind of level of, 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 of craziness. Um, and, and does have all the advantages of, in fact, having its own currency and, it, um, and the single national government and so on, and yet has managed to, um, to, to make pretty much the same policy errors as everybody else. And I'll come back to that a little bit more later on. Um, how do we think about what's going on here? So I think I've got a mix of economists and economic students and then uh, actual human beings in the audience here. Um, um, so apologies to the actual human beings. Uh, maybe apologies to the economic students as well. Um, There's a very old uh, approach to macroeconomics, um, which is um, uh, 65 years old. 75. 75 years old, sorry. I mean, my problems with arithmetic here. Um, it's, is it Keynesian theory? Not clear. It's what John Hicks described as Keynesian theory, and, and there's endless disputes about whether that's what Keynes really meant, which I think are neither here nor there for this discussion. Uh, but John Hicks um, uh, offered this little model, little story, um, which basically said you need to think about both the market for goods and the market for money, and actually the market for bonds, but you can think of that as, uh, um, uh, as, as part of the story. Um, and uh, ISLM, uh, for investment savings, liquidity money, um, it's a model that, well, here's what the, the picture looks like. Um, it's, it's a model that, that um, has largely, in, in graduate courses in economics, basically gets taught anymore because it basically doesn't get taught anymore because, oh, it's so simple, it's so naive, and in public discussion. 
And then what it's turned out is that, that it's actually more sophisticated than the vast bulk of discussion of policy in this crisis, including among professional economists, uh, because it does actually keep track of, of the key relationships. And above all, it tells you that, that, um, that um, uh, the rules change when the economy is sufficiently depressed. What ISLM tells you is that a, a really depressed economy is different. Uh, just for what it's worth, IS is saying other things. It's vanished from the economics profession and vanishing from your screen as well. I'm sorry. I, I don't uh, know. Uh, I'm wondering if I'm doing this by being excessively vigorous and pounding the table. I'll stand back. And, no, that didn't work either. <laughs> oh, my. I don't know, starting sometime, or losing, uh, or is there, I mean, if this was, if it was still Bush under, if it was still America under the Bush administration, I would have said that somehow uh, Homeland Security was doing this, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Whoa! All right. Well, we'll do what we can do. Um, which is, all right. Uh, all right, look, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll describe it for you, and uh, see if we can figure out. Uh, do we think there's a loose connection here? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going to send the signal from upstairs. It is going to go out, but we have to use this microphone. Ah, so. so you can't see it. Maybe it's there, so it's here. Oh, it's okay. I, I, know, I know what my slides are. Okay. All right, so we're going to try this. All right, so apparently it's not, we, we will do something. All right. Um, so what it says is uh, just two things. One, other things equal, the famous other things equal of economics, uh, a lower interest rate will mean more spending. Uh, more, more investment spending, which will then in turn lead to more consumer spending through higher income and, and, and a higher level of GDP. So all of this is presuming, which is, is clearly right, that the economy is being uh, limited by lack of demand. Um, and on the other hand, well, uh, the, the now increasing question about exactly what it is we mean by money, but we certainly do know what, uh, what monetary base what stuff issued by the central bank is. Other things equal, uh, the higher the interest rate, the more people will economize on the use of that. Uh, banks will, will hold fewer reserves. Uh, uh, people will hold less cash in their mattresses. Uh, other things equal, the higher the, uh, the level of activity, the, the, uh, the more um, uh, cash people will want to hold. So we'll have something like an upward sloping uh, Normally, relationship where if the economy expands, there's more demand for money, and people will only be willing to hold the amount of money that's out there if they're given an incentive to, to not hold more by, by raising the interest rate, and that's the LM curve. Normal times, those two curves cross someplace. The central bank can control the money supply, and in practice, it doesn't even do that. The central bank sets a target interest rate, and... Uh, and which it can do because it controls the money supply and, and, and everything else follows from that. But, and this is where it becomes really important, what if for some reason there's been a really large fall in demand? Um, which can happen for a variety of reasons. I'll get to that in a second. Um, in that case, well, uh, what if the place where, uh, uh, what, what if a zero interest rate is not enough to get you to full employment? And uh, which is the, the zero lower bound or the liquidity trap or whatever. But what if, if a zero interest rate is not enough to get you to full employment? Um, in that case, you have the picture I've just given you here, which is one which has a couple of, of, of really strong implications. Um, one of them is it no longer matters at all what the money supply is. No, no matter how much money you print, it just sits there sits there in bank reserves or maybe in people's mattresses. Uh, we saw this, by the way, actually in Japan in the 90s. That was part of what, what alerted some of us to the possibility of this kind of crisis. Uh, I remember actually uh, a, a Japanese economists telling me circa 1998 that the only consumer durables that were selling well in Japan at that point were safes. Because um, everyone was just holding on to cash. Why not? Um, and um, the, um, the other thing it tells you is that as long that things like government deficits, which you might think are going to have a big impact on interest rates, won't, uh, because the economy is sitting below potential. Even if the government borrows a lot of money, what's 
it, it's basically just putting, putting, in effect, putting idle savings to use. It's not, if those of you who are technical, you know, know this, know that that's, strictly speaking, savings always equals investment, but there is a distinction between, um, think about the savings that people would like to make if the economy were anywhere near full employment. The problem is nobody wants to invest those savings. And so you have an economy that's basically awash in, in excess desired savings that, with nowhere to go, which means that government borrowing, uh, um, is actually financed. You ask, where does the money come from? The answer is actually it comes from an expansion of the economy which produces additional savings. It do basically, it doesn't have to come from anywhere. The notion that there's a fixed supply of savings um, is, is all wrong. Um, and that's the world that, that we entered um, in, in 2008. It's the world that the Japanese entered circa 1994. But it's the world that we entered in, in 2008. Um, that's, it's a very strange world once you're in it. It's, this is the world of the liquidity trap, the world of, uh, of, of, uh, of what in a previous book I called depression economics. Um, and it's, a, it's an Alice through the looking glass world. It's a world in which uh, virtue is vice and prudence is folly. A world in which attempts to save more um, actually end up probably reducing overall savings. And a world in which uh, being responsible about the budget, which is pretty much where we are right now, is, um, it can actually be an extremely foolish thing to do. Um, a world in which printing lots of money does nothing. Um, and um, uh, how do we get into this world? So I need to talk about that for a second before I move on to, uh, to, to, to what we've, I think we've learned. Um, by the way, to an important extent, it doesn't matter. That is, the, the precise details of how we got here are in many ways less important than the question of how does this ugly new world that we've entered. How, do, how does that world work and what should we be doing? Um, but for what it's worth, the best going story is that we had, um, above all, um, an excessive buildup of private debt. That we had a, a long period, Hyman Minsky could tell you all about this, we had a long period when, when there had been no really severe economic crises and people forgot about the, uh, the, uh, the risks of, of high levels of leverage and debt. Uh, and then at a certain point, uh, uh, and, and not just, of course, banks forgot about it, households forgot about it, and policy officials forgot about it and, and gradually removed the precautionary regulations that had served to limit our risks. Um, and then at a certain point, we had what uh, Paul McCulley calls the, the Minsky moment. Uh, I, I've always preferred the Wiley Coyote moment. Uh, if you're not familiar with the classics, um, in Runner, Runner cartoons, there's always the point when uh, Wiley Coyote runs about five steps off the edge of the cliff, and it's only when he looks down that um, laws of cartoon physics. But anyway, the, um, um, but the, uh, uh, we get a situation which essentially everybody, all debtors are trying to pay, trying or being forced to pay down their debt at the same time. And the trouble is, of course, that the creditors are not, uh, are not symmetric. So nobody is being forced uh, to, uh, to spend more. All you have is everybody who, or a large, a large fraction of the economy, a large number of the players are, being, are trying or being forced to spend drastically less. And the trouble is that's, that reduces demand. Another way to say it is that, that uh, the, uh, since my, the, certainly the world economy as a whole, and to a large extent even an individual national economy, is a closed system. My spending is your income. Your spending is my income. And if both of us decide that, oh, our debt's too big relative to our income, um, so we better cut our spending, the trouble is we both end up cutting each other's income as well. And it's a, it's a downward spiral. All of which is very, you know, this is not new stuff. Uh, uh, Mark Toma of the blog Economist News uh, made a crack about how new economics seems to consist largely of, of rereading old books. Uh, this is stuff that John Maynard Keynes understood. This is stuff that Irving Fisher understood. Um, and that's the world we're in. The trouble with that world, so it, we, we've got a situation where what is collectively, what is individually reasonable, which is to pay down debt as quickly as possible, is collectively disastrous because it leads to a depressed economy. What you should be doing in that uh, situation is somebody needs to be willing to spend. Somebody needs to be willing to run up debt. Uh, that somebody is uh, most obviously the government. There are some other things you can do as well, which I guess I'll talk about briefly later on, but this is not a time for governments to be emulating the private sector. 
by slashing spending and trying to pay down debt. And yet, of course, that is what, what has been the policy. A couple of words. Uh, I'm, t I'm talking with great confidence as if I know what, how, this, how the world works. Um, and you might ask, you know, why, why listen to me as opposed to other people with a very different view? Um, and the answer is, well, we've actually just run uh, what amounts to a very large set of experiments on all this stuff. Uh, what we've actually, I've, I've been thinking, of, since I have to approve uh, student research proposals, we've been running a set of experiments that would clearly violate Princeton's human research guidelines. Um, uh, uh, experimenting with human subjects, in this case, the, the populations of, of most of the uh, advanced world. Um, um, so we've just, in effect, um, given a, what is a really pretty strong test of, of this view as opposed to various other views that are out there. Um, one implication of this view um, is that uh, when the economy is in this situation, large-scale government borrowing is not actually going to lead to soaring interest rates. And if you've been following this stuff, you know that there were some quite bitter arguments about that in early 2009, and a number of authoritative-sounding people insisting that those deficits, particularly in the United States, were going to lead to, to soaring interest rates. And... Um, uh, we will see whether it's actually, there we go. This is, uh, I like this one because it's the, um, it, it, because we have indexed bonds, you can actually get a direct read on the real interest rate, the interest rate that people expect after inflation. Um, and uh, uh, guess what? The US government can borrow for 10 years at, basically people are willing to pay the US government to hold their, 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 uh, their wealth uh, for periods of, of 10 years and actually somewhat longer. Uh, so, uh, despite huge budget deficits. So there was a prediction, it's not a prediction that everybody was making, it's a prediction that was bitter, bitterly, bitterly contested by a, by a lot of people. But if you believed your ISLM, this is the prediction you made, and sure enough, it has come true. Um, the other prediction was that, uh, that large-scale, uh, uh, large-scale, um, uh, Printing of money, in quotes, printing of money. There hasn't been actually all that much literal printing of, of, of pieces of paper, but, but huge expansion of bank reserves uh, would do nothing, would just sit there and, and, and not, not be wildly inflationary. Uh, again, a lot of people furiously disputing this, this point of view. A um, lot of articles in, uh, um, in, on op-ed pages, a lot of pronouncements from, from well-known economists in 2009 that, that a huge inflationary surge was just around the corner, uh, given the Fed's expansionary policies. Um, and while there is a slight puzzle about why we have net deflation, which I'll talk to, about in a second, um, uh, try our technology yet again. I'm sorry, this is... Uh, does somebody have manual control over these slides? Because I can't seem to get it to advance. There we go. Thank you. Um, monetary base. Ca currency and circulation plus bank reserves. Um, my, uh, my former department chairman, uh, demoted to uh, running the world, is, uh, um, has certainly done plenty of expansion. He's more than tripled the monetary base. And um, uh, there have been incessant predictions of, of, um, of runaway inflation. But as you can see, consumer prices have risen, you know, trivial amount. Uh, uh, which is, again, that, that was a, a prediction bitterly disputed. Uh, so the world has kind of worked in ways that, that suggest that this demand side view is, is right. Um, and, uh, um, and, and, uh, and I'll give you a bit more on that, and again, in, in a couple of minutes. OK, um, everything I said. So my, I, I'm giving you a vision of an economy where the problem is insufficient spending. The problem is all the debtors are, are trying to spend less. The creditors are not willing to spend more. Persistently depressed economy, uh, which has some clear policy implications, if that's the story. A lot of people still keep on wanting to tell you different stories. They want to tell you that it is structural, that, there are, that the problem is much deeper than that, that the, uh, that, that the problem is we have workers that are in the wrong places or with the wrong occupations or the wrong skills, and that there can be no quick uh, solution because we need to re retrain, rearrange our whole economy. That's, there's a deep structural problem. 
Um, this is, people have been saying this, it, it's, it's a position that clearly it, a lot of people want to hold. And so you can see everyone from uh, uh, quite a few of the Federal Reserve Bank governors in, in the United States to Raghur Rajan to various people advancing this position. Um, and the trouble is, uh, well, a couple of things. One is, it, it is kind of interesting to go through, the, to, to do a little bit of historical uh, literature research. Um, and you can find people saying exactly the same things in the 1930s. You can find very learned, serious sounding papers from in the United States from, uh, from uh, mid-1939 explaining that the problem with uh, with America is the fundamental unsuitability of our workforce for, for the demands of our technologically advanced 1930s economy, um, and that it's a deep structural problem, and it's foolish to imagine that a simply increasing demand could actually restore anything like full employment. And certainly there will be no quick fix, it will be many years. Then the uh, war broke out in Europe. Uh, the US was not initially at war, but began, uh, the US economy went to war, as, as Bob Gordon said, in 1940. Began a, a large program of spending to prepare itself for possible involvement. Um, and over the two years that followed, um, there was uh, actually a 20% increase in, in US non farm employment. Uh, that would be uh, 26 million jobs today. Uh, and it turned out that. That, uh, that that workforce wasn't so unsuited to the modern economy after all. Um, or you can look at, the, at, at what's going on right now. So one of the stories you hear, and I, I keep on seeing this, is that, that the problem is, uh, in the United States is geography, that we had these states that had housing bubbles and, and, uh, and they burst, and the trouble with any kind of attempt to boost the economy through demand is it will boost the economy in states that didn't have the big housing bubbles and, and um, and, what, and that, that won't solve the problem because the unemployment problem is concentrated in, in, uh, in, in, in certain parts of the country, which turns out to be just not at all true. Uh, so this is just a, by population, the uh, US states, now what I've indicated is their unemployment range. So it's true that uh, about 19%, about, about one fifth of the US population lives in states that had really extreme housing bubbles and now have very high unemployment. Uh, which would be California uh, and, and Nevada, a few other places. Um, but another third of the population lives in states that uh, did not have particularly big housing bubbles, but still have unemployment between 8 and 9%. That would be places like New York. Um, and uh, if you add in you know, 7% unemployment, sounded like a very high number not that long ago, uh, and three quarters of the country. Is in, is in states with more than 7% than unemployment. The uh, places that are anything like what we used to consider full employment is only, you know, is less, is 8% of the population. There is, there is in fact a region of, of the United States that has genuinely full employment and in fact labor shortages. Uh, it's, it's Nebraska and the, and the, and the two Dakotas, um, which have a combined population approximately equal to that of Brooklyn. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just, it's a, it, this is an economy-wide Failure. So the, the geographical structure argument doesn't work. Um, what about occupations? Uh, do, people, do people need to shift from being one thing? Do they need to shift from being carpenters to being programmers or something? Um, and again, this is something I borrowed from, uh, from my conjole at the Roosevelt Institute. Um, certainly at this level, so the blue bar is unemployment in 2007, the red bar is unemployment uh, in 2012, and it's true that construction uh, has seen a big increase in unemployment, but basically so has everything else. If you want to find, you know, basically if the problem is that we have a, the wrong kinds of workers, then the, the, right, the right kind of workers must be doing well, right? They must be in a high demand. And it's really hard to find those right kind of workers. There are very, very narrow specialties that are in, in some shortage, but really, really narrow. It's, there's really nothing. It, everything suggests that what we have is a general lack of demand for labor. Um, since I'm trying to be as honest as I can about the evidence, I should say that there is one thing that has come as a surprise. So we, people like me were not right about everything. Um, a lot of us looked at Japan uh, and thought that the United States by now ought to be on the edge of deflation, if not into actual deflation. 
And what has actually turned out is that uh, low but positive inflation has been really stubborn. Um, and that in the United States is basically because wages um, have continued to rise, albeit slowly. So let's try. Uh, there we go. Um, this is the rate of change of average hourly earnings in the private sector in the US, which dropped substantially uh, with the slump, but has since, you know, that's presumably noise going on in there, but the, uh, has since sort of leveled out at, at a, a bit less than two. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of sign of, of actual falling wages. The question is, you know, it, what does that mean? In particular, is that evidence? And as some people have said, uh, some Federal Reserve governors, some others have said that the fact that we're not continuing to see that we're not sliding ever lower into actual wage decline and, and deflation is evidence that the economy is actually not that far from full employment. Um, but it's becoming, I think it's pretty clear now that, that what, what's actually going on here, which is that um, it is really, really hard to cut wages, actual cuts in wages. It just almost never happens um, anywhere. and. Um, and so as a result, um, the story about the United States right now is that many workers who are, who, who are of types, occupations, locations that are in huge excess supply, um, basically th their wages aren't rising, but they're not falling either. And then there are some workers that have enough bargaining power to get some wage increases. And so the overall result is a, uh, an increase in, uh, in the average wage. And if you want to you say, well, if that's true, if we actually looked at the distribution of wage changes, there ought to be a big spike and right at zero, right? Bing, large spike right at zero. Uh, turns out that, that we have a whole lot of people who are getting precisely zero wage changes in the United States, um, which is telling you that, no, we're not near full employment. What we're witnessing is what happens at very low inflation. For those who are in the economists uh, in the audience, what this also actually says is that the long-run Phillips curve is not vertical at low inflation. That at low inflation rates, there actually is a trade-off even in the long run. That's, but, but in any case, it's, this, is, this is the story. Um, picture of the United States, then. Hugely depressed economy because of inadequate demand. Um, remains deeply depressed. Lots of damage. Uh, being done. Um, what about the UK? Well, the answer, when I look at the data, uh, if I may say, by the way, UK, I, the data are hard to work with. It's, uh, for, for some reason, our stuff is neater. Uh, but anyway, um, so this is not, these are not exactly comparable series. It's the average hourly earnings. It's the average weekly normal pay. Uh, in the UK, but uh, which I think is more cyclical, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, basically we're the same. UK economy looks just like the US economy when you look at, at, at wage changes. Um, headline inflation's been higher here, but that almost certainly reflects a series of special events. Uh, that increases uh, uh, depreciation of the pound um, and falling fast now. So I look at the data and say the UK looks just like the US. Uh, in, 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 in the ways that matter. So what do you do in this situation? Well, what the textbook says, certainly my textbook says, but anyway, but, but, uh, but, um, but what, what we, look, if we, if we had encountered this crisis in, um, in 1971, when, uh, when Richard Nixon declared, I am a Keynesian in economic policy, uh, we would have known what to do. If we'd encountered it in 1948, when people had read Paul Samuelson's textbook, first edition, we would have known what to do, which is to say, this is a time when the government needs to step up. Uh, by all means, let's worry about debt and deficits in the long run, but not now. In a depressed economy, you really should not be. It's actually useful for the government to run a deficit and spend. Um, and so we really should be, uh, we, we should be, uh, Acting, this is a time for the government to, to act as, as the, uh, the spender of last resort, if you like. Supplement that with exotic monetary policy, unconventional monetary policy, if you can. Supplement it with debt relief, if you can do that. Um, if you like, if you're really worried, try to lock in long-term budget restraint but, so that, that in the long run things will work out, but not right now. 
This is, um, if you say, I wor I'm worried about debt and deficits, fine, but this is the time to quote St. Augustine, uh, oh Lord, make me chaste and continent, but not yet. Um, even an argument, well, so, okay, so two years ago, a strange mania swept uh, a lot of the policy community, uh, especially here, uh, especially in Europe, less so in the United States. Uh, but uh, we have our own problems, as I said, uh, uh, which was the view that, no, actually, it's okay, in fact, desirable to slash spending even in a deeply depressed economy because it won't really be contractionary, or at least hardly at all, because what will happen is that by showing that you're willing to get the budget deficit under control, you will inspire confidence. And confidence will lead to higher, uh, higher private spending. And so it'll actually, you know, so the doctrine of expansionary austerity, based upon some quest highly questionable academic work, but mostly I think based upon the feeling that this is somehow how it ought to be. Um, and so now we've had two years of test. Um, and uh, um, just, uh, it, uh, it, I might mention actually that uh, if you go back to when this austerity mania was developing, which is early 2010, uh, Ireland was being held up as a role model um, because Ireland moved early and quickly to really intense budget austerity. Um, and, uh, and we were told it was being rewarded and we will soon be seeing an Irish recovery. And you can find some wonderful uh, um, opinion pieces in, in the, the UK press from the spring saying Ireland is the model that Britain needs to follow, that, that they've shown the way out of the crisis. Of course, you can find Jean-Claude Trichet saying that Ireland is the role model that Greece needs to follow. And uh, well, the Irish have certainly doggedly kept their austerity um, and uh, have yet to see any recovery. 15% unemployment, 30% youth unemployment. Uh, not as bad as Greece. I guess that goes up a, uh, as a slogan along with not as bad as the Great Depression. Uh, but, but, uh, but has not worked. In fact, contraction is contractionary. Keynes was right. Um, um, at the time, I think my enduring contribution to the language of economics here probably is uh, I called the belief that, that confidence would offset the direct effects of slashing government spending. Um, uh, believing in the confidence fairy. Um, and so uh, um, uh, have we seen any, any sightings? Um, so, uh, so when the, the, new, uh, when, when the, uh, the current coalition in Britain came to power, it was very much uh, that the whole strategy was based around the belief that austerity would actually be expansionary that there was no need to backload the austerity, that in fact you should front load it, get it on fairly quickly, um, because it would inspire confidence and that would be great stuff. Um, and um, well, okay, uh, the promised expansion in private spending never happened. Um, and by the way, people will say, well, much of the austerity hasn't hit yet, which is true. But it was supposed to inspire confidence and lead to, uh, to an expansion of, of of private spending, and that just has not happened. So these days, what the coalition points to is uh, interest rates. They say we can borrow cheaply, and that shows that we have, in fact, inspired confidence. Um, the problem is uh, that every country with its own currency, every advanced country with its own currency borrowing in its own currency has seen interest rates fall a lot. So US, UK, nothing, you know. They moved in parallel, and do you see the, uh, the big, uh, narrowing of the gap after uh, the coalition came to power? Well, neither do I. Nothing, nothing happened, right? It's been, uh, um, it has, you know, Brit Britain has its own currency. It borrows in its own currency. Uh, it just hasn't been, um, uh, um, has, hasn't seen any, any, uh, um, any, any, any benefit that you can, that's visible from, from the austerity. Um, what about, and you say, well, isn't, isn't the debt level incredibly high and incredibly scary? Um, and there's two answers to that. Um, the first answer is it is certainly a lot higher than you'd like it to be. And it's no question. Uh, it would have been really nice uh, if Britain had come into this with lower, much lower debt levels. Although worth pointing out that 
Spain and Ireland both came into this crisis with very low debt levels, and that hasn't seemed to help them very much. Still, better to have lower debt levels. And, uh, and when this is all over, if it's ever all over, uh, we'd really like to see debt levels brought down again. Um, but um, history has shown that advanced countries that borrow in their own currencies can run quite high levels of debt for quite long periods of time uh, without catastrophe. And nobody illustrates that better than the UK. Um, this is uh, uh, debt as a percentage of GDP for, now it's only up through 2010, so it's gone up more since then, but still, right? Uh, boy. So actually, it's funny, you sometimes find people asserting that when John Maynard Keynes wrote about deficit spending in the 30s, well, but you know, back then Britain didn't have high levels of debt the way it does now. Actually, it had, it had higher levels of debt when Keynes was writing than it does now. Um, just shows that you can go a, a really long time. Of course, those, those debts were run up uh, uh, for wars, uh, but it, it took a long time before they were brought down. Um, and so Britain's history itself shows that, that levels of debt comparable to what we have now are, are what you have now are not, are not a problem, and um, are, are not, are not a, a crippling problem. I wouldn't say they're no problem, and I wouldn't say to be at ease about it. And certainly, going back to the U.S. context, I really, really wish that we hadn't uh, had the, those two unfunded tax cuts and those two unfunded wars, because uh, we'd be about $3 trillion uh, better in our debt position right now, which would give us more flexibility. Uh, but but uh, nothing, like, uh, uh, nothing like the crisis at which it's portrayed. By the way, everything, I, I complain a lot about the, the Hellenization of our discourse. Uh, everything is Greece. It's all Greece. Everybody's about to turn into Greece any day now, unless they do uh, various extreme things. Um, Greece is a really bad example. Uh, in, actually, in, in multiple senses of the word, right? But, uh, uh, but they were irresponsible, clearly, even during the good times. Um, they are a, a country that has a lot of trouble actually collecting revenue. Um, and above all, they don't have their own currency. And that's made all the difference. There, if you're looking for anything that looks like a debt crisis, I wouldn't say it's, it's strictly speaking only Eurozone countries. You also have something that looks a fair bit like a debt crisis in Hungary, but that's because of large-scale borrowing in foreign currencies. So it's, it's, uh, but countries that are borrowing in their own currency, it's just uh, um, the idea that, that a country like the UK or the United States is about to face a Greek-style crisis any day now. Uh, it just does, doesn't fit the, the record, and of course doesn't fit what the bond market is saying. The bond market is basically saying, borrow, borrow, please. This is not a bad time to, to do that. It's only, it's only the politicians who are saying otherwise. I said that was the first part of an answer. Uh, the second part of an answer is, um, there's very good reason to believe that fiscal austerity under depression conditions um, is self-defeating even in purely fiscal terms. That even if, even if you are preoccupied above all with the soundness of, of your budget and the ability to, uh, to convince markets in the long run that you can pay your debts, uh, slashing spending in, in, in when the economy is already depressed, when it's already at the zero lower bound, probably hurts that. Now, there's a, a, a long, detailed analysis uh, uh, by, by Larry Summers and Brad DeLong, published recently, uh, making that point. Um, let me just say it briefly. Um, the, uh, the uh, first thing is that even in the short run, to cut government spending, it makes the economy more depressed, which means lower revenue. So part of, part of whatever you gain at the top is taken out at the bottom. But more important, or for the longer run, is there's lots of reasons to believe that having a persistently depressed economy actually detracts from your long run growth as well. That it reduces economic potential in a couple of ways. The long term unemployed, if they're unemployed long enough, they probably become, if not actually unemployable, seen as unemployable. They lose their, their connection to the workforce. Uh, young people graduating into an impossible job market may never get to to make use of their expensively acquired skills. Um, business investment stays depressed because the economy is depressed, and that means that you'll run into capacity constraints sooner than you might have otherwise. Uh, so all this goes under the unhelpful name of hysteresis. Um, if you look at the UK debate, it's kind of different. In the US, we're debating whether maybe 
potential output has been adversely affected by the crisis. In the UK, everybody has, seems to have bought into the notion that there's been this spectacular decline in, uh, in the track of potential output, that the economies, that the full employment level of output in Britain is vastly lower than you would have expected if you had extrapolated from the trend before the crisis. Um, I'm skeptical about that. It seems to me that, that, that people are, are grasping for that very quickly based on pretty limited evidence. Some surveys, uh, the failure of inflation to fall, but there are other explanations for that. But in any case, if, if anything like this is true, then the crisis is taking a terrible toll on the long run. And then you have to wonder, would the toll be quite so terrible if the British economy were being run closer to full employment right now? And if so, then the argument would be that, that these, uh, the, these austerity policies are really, uh, are really destructive. Um, that they, they are, I think this is a pretty exact analogy. It is really like um, uh, medieval doctors who believed that the treatment for all illnesses was to bleed the patients and let the evil humors out. And then when the patients, uh, as they normally did, became sicker, uh, they said, well, we need to bleed them even more. And that seems to be what, what the kind of cycle that austerity policies are getting into. So I have no idea how long I'm talking, but I'm sure it's too long. Let me, uh, let me just go on to a, a last, well, I actually have a final, a final slide to make here. Uh, um, so again, saying it, so let, let me, um, Europe is pursuing, the Eurozone is pursuing austerity policies in most of the, out of, because countries don't have their own currencies and they've uh, lost all access to private credit markets and so they're basically being forced into austerity as a condition for, for, uh, for support from, from, uh, from bas basically from Germany, or, you know, from Frankfurt and Berlin. The IMF is in there, but it's basically Frankfurt and Berlin are demanding that they do austerity policy. So they don't have a whole lot of choice except the nuclear option of leaving the euro, which may be coming, but that's a... Um, the United States, we actually have quite a lot of fiscal austerity in the United States, not through deliberate policy, but because um, uh, we have deadlock in Washington and state and local governments um, basically can't run deficits and are being forced into sharp cutbacks. So we have a lot of austerity. Britain, without any of those constraints, is nonetheless following the same track of, of austerity. Uh, so it is, it, is the, uh, it is the unforced error in, in the policy world. I mean, I, I, I yield to nobody in, in my claim that U.S. politics are completely screwed up. Um, but, uh, but the sort of um, policy mistakes with intent are kind of uh, unique, I, I think, here. Um, and what they come from is from worrying about the wrong stuff. So um, tremendous, I mean, a lot of fear out there. And, and policy has been driven very much here by dire warnings about what will happen if we don't do exactly what the coalition is doing. And uh, um, you hear the same thing in the United States, but, um, but our, 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 our policy debate is a, is a lot more chaotic. But here it was just, well, if we don't do this, then, then uh, the, the bond markets will desert us and interest rates will be sent sky high, um, which is based upon basically nothing. It's based upon uh, um, the extremely dubious analysis of uh, the extremely dubious analogy with Greece and and and, uh, and the rest of the eurozone periphery, um, and there's been no hint of that, right? So I tell you, the the bond vigilantes keep on not making an appearance. Uh, so in the United States, we've had the same kinds of warnings, and uh, uh, it's not too long ago people were saying, you know, the real well, the real crisis will come when when the rating agencies downgrade America. And, uh, and they did, and, or S&P did, and nothing at all happened. Uh, and now the same kind of thing is said here. Uh, by the way, all predictable. Japan had a downgrade in 2002, and nothing happened. Uh, advanced country, stable government, able to borrow in its own currency, not a problem. The United States might break that mold finally, because I'm not sure that we have a stable government. I'm not sure that we have a, a functioning polity at all, but anyway. Um, and the other thing is belief that, well, that, that investors and consumers will be scared about the future burden of debt, and we need to uh, appease the, the confidence fairy. Uh, and there's been no hint. Uh, overwhelmingly, it, it appears that what seems to move confidence is, is fear about lack of jobs. And in the case of businesses, fear about lack of sales. And so that hasn't worked at all. 
Meanwhile, we've been amazingly blasé about, uh, first of all, the sheer scale of the costs that we're bearing right now. So I'm not ready to come up with my own estimate of the British output gap. But for the US, it's clear that it's 6 or 7% of GDP, which is to say that there's something like a trillion dollars worth of goods and services we should be producing each year that we are not producing. And, that's, and we'll never get that back. Each year, that's, a, that's, that's basically taking a, a trillion dollars worth of, of, of value and, uh, and burning it. That's huge. You'd think that that, that that prospect would weigh pretty heavily on, on the minds of policymakers. Um, and then there's a lot of reason to believe that we are inflicting really, really substantial long-term damage, that it's not just the current loss of output, but long-term damage uh, to economic potential, and I should say human also. The, the human costs of this are, are more important than the money, ultimately. The human costs are what, are what makes this uh, so terrible. Uh, people's lives are being destroyed. Uh, it's, uh, I guess there's a kind of a bubble that, that a lot of people in, in the Beltway and maybe in Brussels or whatever live in. Uh, but it must be a pretty impervious bubble because I'm, you know, I'm an awfully privileged life, an awfully rarefied circles, and yet I know lots of people whose lives are being destroyed because they can't find a job. I know, pe I know young people who get out of school and, and are, are in despair because there's no, there's no prospects for them. I, I know people my age, men my age, who've, who've, who've lost a job and, and see no prospect of ever getting another. This is a, it's a terrible thing out there, and we're just sort of letting it slide uh, in favor of appeasing the, the, the invisible bond vigilantes and, and the confidence fairies. Um, it's a terrible, terrible mistake, and, uh, and ultimately unforgivable. Um, for us to, to be making all of the mistakes of the 1930s, despite having all the lessons of the 1930s, um, there for us to, to study. Is, is a terrible, terrible thing, and we need to stop it. Thanks. So, well, what are our logistics here? We have questions. Uh, so, I, I guess, is, are there mics, or do I just, uh, I don't know how we handle this. Oh, there are mics. So, so I guess, uh, all right, well, somebody here, and there's a mic nearby. Okay. Let me, uh, let, let's take, I think, the um, gentleman there was the Hi. first. Oh, okay. Um, no. My name's Asid, and my question is, when, if we do come out of this depression, should um, economies move on from using conventional macroeconomic theory and devising their policies? Ah, uh, so when should we move on from using conventional macroeconomic theory? Wow, um, I would say <laughs> conventional macroeconomic theory has done great. I mean, that's one of the really weird things in this crisis is that the, the radical crazy people like, like me have been the ones who actually take the textbook seriously. And all of the respectable people, I've actually picked up a phrase you've probably seen from the, uh, picked it up from the blogger, uh, uh, Duncan Black, who, who's who is actually an economist, although his blog is basically political, and, he's, uh, and he's, he has, uh, being, not being a New York Times blog, he can use all the words I can't, but, uh, but he does, one of the phrases I can repeat of his is, he, he likes the term very serious people, capital V, capital S, capital P. So all of the very serious people have basically tossed out macroeconomic theory, standard macro, uh, have tossed out ISLM and, and all of that, and, and made up their own version of macro to justify their policies. So it's been a really strange environment in which the, the, the wild and crazy and radical people are the ones who actually think that, that, that economics as we know it is, is, should be applied in this crisis. And the sensible people are the ones who, who have all kinds of exotic uh, theory made up on the fly to justify not doing anything about unemployment. Could, could you say who you are, please, before asking a question? There's a question there. Right. Yeah. Uh um, Eric Lonergan here. First of all, can I just say thank you very much um, for talking such sense, which is pretty rare in Europe at the moment. Uh, I remember reading Peddling Prosperity as, an under, as a postgraduate here, and I have to say I, I still have to come back to Paul Krugman to get any inspiration. Um, could I just add a, a point to your chart on the UK on the, on the debt-GDP ratio, just yeah. to add further strength to your argument? 
you should consolidate the balance sheet of the Bank of England. The Bank of England today owns 30% of the stock of debt. Any fiscal sustainability equation will be done on a net debt basis. The UK's net debt is actually declining. So actually, huge private sector liquidity preference is a fiscal free lunch. So there isn't even a debt sustainability issue there. But the, the key question I'd like to get your thoughts on, because you haven't spoken much about it, is the issue of what is to be done. And it seems to me your, your principal recommendation is a lot more QE and trying to raise inflation expectations. No. My, my problem with QE is it's a very in, indirect way of targeting aggregate demand, which is our objective. Isn't the most direct way to increase aggregate demand is to give central banks the ability to credit household bank accounts with cash? Okay. If, the, if the Fed transferred a trillion dollars to the U.S. household mm -hmm. sector, the U.S. economy would boom. All right. Um, wow. It's more, there's more stuff in there that I can unpack. So, no, actually, my first... Re my, my first line of policy is actually um, uh, that, that you start with fiscal policy, just plain old fiscal policy, which in terms of sheer economics has the great advantage that, uh, that we know that it has a direct impact, no uncertainty about it. If, uh, if the um, government goes out and, and, and uh, either directly hires people or contracts to have people do stuff, then that, that's a, a direct demand creation. Um, in the U.S., it's actually a very easy thing. The question is, okay, but then what should the government spend money on? And then the funny thing in the U.S. is because we actually have had so much austerity at the state and local level that you can get a substantial now stimulus just by reversing that austerity, just by having the federal government provide aid to the states and localities so that they can rehire the school teachers and, uh, and rehire the police officers and, and fill in the potholes that have been accumulating from deferred maintenance. Uh, right there, by my back of the envelope, you can um, add more than a million jobs directly and, um, and, and, and produce about $300 billion a year, about 2% of GDP of stimulus, which under, under current circumstances would get you a long way back towards full employment. Here, I'm less certain about, because I don't know the details, but there have been already substantial cutbacks in public investment. So uh, there would appear to be room for that. QE terrible name, eh? but, but you know, buy, buying of unconventional assets by the central bank is a very, it's operating on a margin that's probably not very effective. It was one thing to be, I'm not against it, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to basically try anything here, uh, but, the, uh, but I, don't, I think that the argument that there, that's a really effective policy is, is dubious and nothing in recent events has, has, has really changed uh, that view. A higher inflation target, if it can lead people to believe that there'll be some inflation that will uh, uh, reduce expected future debt burdens, it will reduce private sector debt burdens, it will uh, uh, cre reduce the incentive to sit on cash, that's also possible. Um, I guess just plain handing out, so a, a more or less a literal helicopter operation, just plain handing out cash, um, you'd have to have a commitment that, that uh, I mean, that, what that is, that, that's actually just a uh, um, in effect, it's a, it's a government tax credit that's financed by printing money. Um, I don't think actually the, you know, I, I think about, I don't know how it would handle legally here. In the United States, um, the, the, the Fed would have to be held harmless because if they eventually have to reduce the monetary base uh, to control inflation, they'd end up taking a big loss. So, so it would, in fact, end up being, for all practical purposes, a, 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 a government uh, cash transfer, which I guess is you know better than nothing, but but not the most effective form of stimulus. Uh, but uh, you know if, if we could, but it, you know it would never be approved. Uh, it would it would be for the same reasons the, to, to to believe that the people who who are uh, as, who are slashing extended unemployment benefits as we speak, um, and who are uh, uh, trying to slash food stamps and uh, and. Uh, and, and nutritional aid to women, uh, to pregnant women, uh, are going to say, oh, but it's okay for the Fed to, uh, to go and give, e give everybody uh, an equal cash transfer with the federal government uh, holding the, the uh, uh, you know, standing ready to, to, to make up for any losses that might be incurred. That's, that's, that just doesn't help any. In general, I guess I would say that the notion that there is some clever way to bypass the political process uh, is probably wrong. Uh, the, uh, let's, put the, let's put it this way: the um, the people who are opposing any kind of any kind of of, of 
fiscal stimulus, any kind of measure to, to help the less fortunate in, in American society. Um, uh, they may be evil, but they're not idiots. Uh, and you're not going to be able to put one over on them on that front. OK, there's a question here, then followed by one upstairs and one behind there. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Paul, for that fascinating lecture. Um, Jonathan Portis from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. And I Research. can't actually see where you are. <laughs> down there. All right, great. Oh, All right, hi I'll, there. I'll stand up. Jonathan Portis from the National Institute. Um, as you know, I agree with most of the analysis and a lot of the commonalities between the US and the UK. But one thing which is quite different is the employment experience. That graph does look actually very different here. We haven't right. had, we've had a much less marked fall in employment right. or rise in unemployment and a much, uh, whereas the US has had this measured productivity surge, right. which, uh, whereas we've had stagnant productivity. And that's underlying a lot of, I think that I probably explains why you get this output pessimism here, which I, like you, I share the skepticism about that uh, yeah. ODR graph, but it's much difficult to argue against when you do see this measured productivity loss. Do you have any views on why the U.S. labor market, and, and, and nobody, I think, ex ante would have predicted that the U.S. labor market would predict, have performed so much worse than the U.K. or indeed the German one. Um, is there any macro explanation for this? Oh, yeah. That, that's a really, uh, that, that's a question that, that really um, you and I should hash out at some length in, a, um, in front of a blackboard, I think. But, um, um, but no, I think it's a, and, and the answer is I don't know quite what's going on. Although what I would say is that the, uh, despite all of the, uh, the, despite Margaret Thatcher and all of that, uh, there, there's a brutality, uh, uh, a capitalism red and tooth and claw aspect to U.S. labor markets that you still don't find here. That I, I, I believe that, there is, uh, that firms are much less concerned about uh, the effects on, on morale of just plain sacking lots of people in the US. And so, um, so a good guess, but when, I don't know this, would be that, that you actually are seeing some labor hoarding, uh, reluctance to lay people off in the UK. Now, I understand the survey say, say that the, the companies say that they don't have excess capacity. And that, so I, I'm a little puzzled by that. And the, you know, the, UK, the UK productivity experience is really weird uh, from a US point of view. The German less so. Uh, Germany, there was, uh, uh, although there's some of that too. Um, and one possibility, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so, the, so I guess this is kind of a long-winded uh, way of saying I don't know. There's something, there's something st extremely strange going on. And if we didn't have that employment number, uh, we'd be really would say, um, that, that, that they were identical, but that is a difference. Um, it's, by the way, it's not just, there, there, are some, there are some odd discrepancies between um, growth measures and employment measures across uh, advanced countries. Uh, um, Spain doesn't look like it's had all that severe a slump in GDP terms, and yet catastrophic employment. So there are some real puzzles there. It's upstairs, yes. Um, Linda Korsha, can, can you see up here, yeah? Okay. okay. Right. Thanks. I, it's a, you um, have to understand. I'm also, the, the the light is making it hard for me to see what I'm. Okay. Is. Doesn't matter. Um, I also <laughs> <laughs> I also want to talk about uh, the labour issue. I think people dance around that to quite an extent, and I want to talk about the UK situation too. When you say that uh, government should be the spender of last resort, I presume that you do mean for jobs, creating jobs, and the earn spend cycle, but. In the UK, we have uh, free movement of labour within the EU and as well as the mode for trade commitments. And, um, and, the, or, and according to the Office of National Statistics, 90% of jobs have gone in the last few years to um, migrant workers. And so this is not me ranting, this is the Office of National Statistics. Yeah. And uh, that affects tax take and the earn spend cycle, ex um, expatriated earnings, loss of skills here, high, un uh, high unemployment welfare payments. So um, it's, the discussion here is about austerity or spending, but it seems to me that in a situation uh, of that, uh, that sort of labor supply, that 
no uh, economic stimulus or Keynesian stimulus is actually possible? Okay, I would be... Um, I would... The, the question of how many jobs taken at the margin... How many jobs have actually been taken is not... I, that's an interesting thing, and I'll have to look into it. Uh, but I, I would very much doubt that a, that a marginal employment creation would actually be 90%. Uh, uh, taken by by in migrants, I'd be st I'd be shocked at that because nothing like that is true even at the level of U.S. states. We just uh, um, you just look and and uh, in the U.S. context, it it takes uh, uh, quite a few years, even in the U.S., for labor mobility to uh, to basically absorb any any initial change in employment. Uh, so at the state level, so I'd be I'd be shocked if the if if labor mobility into and out of the UK were higher than labor mobility into or out of, say, California. Uh, and maybe that's, maybe that's somehow true in the data, but I, I, as I say, I'd be really shocked if that were the case. And what? Well, do you, in the United States? Uh, last I noticed, we don't have free movement. Uh, we don't have free movement across the border into Mexico, but that's not the... Uh, <laughs> And actually, closer to that than you might imagine. But anyway, the uh, but but I mean, you know, we 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 have the the, the take has always been that that the U.S. has has huge um, uh, interregional labor mobility. I mean, and and in fact, that that's that's one of the ways that we try and estimate multipliers is by looking at at uh, at region specific uh, spending shocks. And uh, so I I'd be surprised, but that's that's interesting. And I do I, um, that is one. Yeah, uh, have to have to uh, uh, consider that a bit. But you know, let, take a look. Uh, take a look at the reverse. Take a look at, at at the effects of economic contraction and austerity, and ask the question: Has uh, I mean, um, uh, hard to think of a, of a country that's uh, that's as likely to have extremely high mobility in and out as Ireland. And yet, that hasn't stopped their austerity programs from sending their unemployment rate sky high. So, if it was really this kind of, you know, the, the water flows to wherever, uh, uh, wherever it, 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 it uh, the water e water level equalizes everywhere, no matter what you do, uh, that shouldn't have happened. So, it, it might be the case that there's a different story for the UK, but it would be hard to believe. Uh, again, it's just a, it is striking to me that that uh, that the Irish who are who, who have you know multiple potential destinations that, that speak the same language uh, has still not had that kind of labor mobility. There was a question back there. Hi, Paul. My name is Rachel McGovern. Thank you very much for your discussion. Um, you mentioned during the talk that it's, it's very difficult to, to, I suppose, lower wages. And, and this is a, a process of... The process of internal devaluation is what yeah. Ireland has been attempting to do. Right. Um, anybody who's been to Dublin recently will tell you it hasn't happened. Um, it's still outrageously expensive, unless you're staying in a NAMA-owned hotel. Um, in the context of, of ourselves being within the Eurozone and restricted in our kind of monetary and fiscal policy, is it possible for us to, to internally devalue? Okay. Is there any way or means of doing it? Okay, so for those who don't know the, the, uh, the jargon here, uh, there must be some. Uh, what, hap what happens if you had a, a, a localized boom and then a bust? And, uh, um, and during the boom, wages, prices, unit labor costs tend to rise relative to, to other places. And then the bust comes, and you really have to retrace that step. Uh, the, um, Spain is actually the even clearer example. Spain had you know, uh, a gigantic housing residential construction boom, um, also moved into enormous current account deficit, enormous trade deficit, basically. Then the construction boom went bust, and it basically has to restore, and it has to, to, um, has to become a, a sell a lot more manufactured goods again to, to make up for the, the loss of construction employment. Um, and to do that, it has to get its costs down relative to the rest of the Eurozone. Um, which is supposed to happen, as you say, through internal devaluation, through a fall in Spanish wages relative to wages elsewhere in Europe. Um, and, um, and that turns out to be really, really hard, because wages, nominal wages, just don't like to fall. 
uh, anywhere. Ireland was supposed to be famous for its flexibility in labor markets, and even so, it's only a few percent. Uh, there, were some, there was a, a brief flurry last fall. The poor Irish keep on being held up as a successful role model, only to have the success turn out to be a, a mirage. Uh, there was a brief flurry because their unit labor costs seemed to have gone way down, but that was actually just a compositional effect. Basically, the, uh, the collapse of everything except pharmaceuticals, which is very high value added. Um, and, uh, the, um, and so there's very, now the question is, is there any way to make this work Within, uh, within the Euro area. Um, and uh, I guess those of us, I, I want to see, see if the Euro can be saved. Uh, um, as sort of, so uh, in, in, instead, of, instead of raising the bridge, lowering the water, or maybe it's the other way around, uh, that, that if you can have faster wage growth in Germany, then you don't need to have uh, large wage cuts in Ireland and Spain. So a higher Eurozone inflation target would make it easier. Uh, not easy, but easier to achieve the, the needed adjustment. It's, in a way, that's the flip side of, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the story I gave you about the concentration of U.S. wage changes at, at zero. That's the same thing, basically, that's happening at a national level in, in Europe. Um, hard. And it's, uh, it um, and, and, and has been deeply unrealistic, the, uh, the, the belief that we could achieve that needed adjustment in Europe uh, by, by getting large wage cuts. You know, there's a lot of lecturing from from uh, uh, from from uh, senior officials that that countries should have flexible labor markets in, in which wages can easily fall as well as rise, uh, <coughs> which is a little bit like saying that that uh, that adults should be uh, faithful and never have affairs. It would be a good thing, but it, it just isn't going to happen given the way human nature is. And uh, um, so it, it's that's not a solution. So you have to. Have, I think the eurozone is only is only workable with a significantly higher target rate of inflation than, than the 2% the or less that, the, that, that has been the ECB's norm. So that, that I think, is the answer. Okay, we have a question here, upstairs, at the back, and one here, and I think that's about it. Make sure that your question requires only a short answer. Yes, no. Uh, <laughs> I'll flip a coin to decide which, which one to give. Anyway, yes. Um, Professor Krugman, um, I was really fascinated by uh, your, your kind of assertion that World War II, uh, beginning World War II, provides evidence for the Keynesian worldview. Um, firstly, I, I would probably argue that a lot of the drop in unemployment was due to conscription. But I think more crucially, okay. um, look at the end of World War II, um, when um, government spending dropped massively because of the end of war spending, and about 10 million people left, government work, left the government workforce due to being demobbed or leaving war industries, etc. Um, and indeed, Paul Samuelson predicted that this uh, colossal drop in AD would lead to a kind of resumption of the Great Depression. Um, instead, the um, US economy bo boomed. Don't you think this undermines somewhat your conception of the economy as driven by aggregate demand, specifically by government, government spending? Okay, so first of all, the conscription thing is not right, because if you actually look, uh, it just isn't right by the numbers. Uh, you can look at the actual employment numbers. Remember, that, was not, that wasn't a reduction in the labor force. That was a 20% increase in employment that I was talking about. Uh, there was actually a large fall in GDP at the end of World War II. The, uh, if you actually do a, a scatter plot of changes in government spending, uh, versus changes in GDP. Uh, it is dominated by the war experience, but both up and down. There was a large negative multiplier uh, uh, from, from the decline in war spending. Now, the question why the economy didn't relapse into depression afterwards is an interesting one. Um, my current take on it, which is, is more of a, um, an educated guess than a definitive uh, story, but if you actually look, um, private sector debt relative to income was vastly lower at the end of the war than it had been before. Uh, partly because you'd had a wartime when people had, had high incomes and, 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 weren't, were, and, and couldn't borrow, couldn't spend. Uh, and partly because there was about a 60% rise in the price level over the course of the war, which meant that the real value of outstanding debt was greatly eroded. So the story about why we didn't relapse into depression at the end of the war, I think, has a lot to do with the fact that, that the underlying overhang of household debt that plays such a big role in, in, in causing and perpetuating the Great Depression was eliminated, uh, which would suggest that if we really wanted to follow that model, what we'd want is a burst of, of government spending sufficient to generate some inflation that erodes some of the debt. Uh, and the question then is how to get that uh, burst of, of government spending. And, and, um, and I have to say that while you know, politically examples of sufficient, of adequate size stimulus programs are very, very hard to find. Uh, 
uh, uh, China, South Korea, and uh, that's probably not my proposal, uh, uh, which is, has been that we invent a fake threat from, from space aliens, because uh, uh, that's the only way I see for the United States to actually do uh, th that kind of spending. Okay. Uh, so upstairs. I'm afraid yep. we only have time for questions by Hello? those who are holding microphones, and there's one upstairs. All right. Yes. Sorry. Uh, Dan Sofa, uh, uh, Professor Krugman, yeah. you, you've uh, talked quite a bit about us returning to the 30s, which in many ways we are. One way in which we are possibly is that there's a, there's a murmur of uh, criticism about the way the banking system works, particularly about fractional reserve banking. Now, I know in the States that's been somewhat confused by... Um, uh, the gold bugs and Ron Paul's view on this, but there are more sober voices, people like the uh, New Economics Foundation in the UK, yeah. who have been making quite, quite a good case for this. Uh, but I know you have been quite critical of those voices in the recent past, and I just wonder, you, you know, in the light of the way that reserve ratios have just blown out to the point where governments gave off on them in many countries, the way the managers in the yeah. 80s utterly failed to control the money supply because of what the banks were doing, completely out of the control of uh, the various treasuries around the world. I just wonder if maybe you begin to soften your position and thinking that there may be a case for changing the way that banking works, changing the way that particularly yeah. fractional reserve banking works, and possibly even nationalizing that particular function within the economy. OK. Um, boy, that's not a yes or no. Two, 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 two points. One, one is fractional reserve banking, or something like it, does serve a useful economic purpose. It does allow us, to some extent, to uh, to, to, to have our liquidity and eat it, too. To, to, uh, it serves a, you know, a uh, diamond divvig, for those of you who, uh, who know your stuff, right? They're, they're, uh, that, that's, that's actually a productive activity as long as you can, can control crises. And it's not practical. I mean, you can, uh, to say, you know, U.S.-type slogan, right? If you, if, you, if you criminalize fractional reserve banking, only criminals will have fractional reserve banking. Um, that, that you can't. You can't. I mean, uh, you can possibly say that depository institutions have to hold all of the money actually in their vaults. But then shadow banks will spring up to, to, to engage in, in. No, I mean, look, we had a perfectly, uh, we had a, not perfectly, we had a workable system for half a century after the 1930s which was a fractional reserve banking system, but one with capital requirements, with regulation, with, uh, with oversight. And it was a system that was free from major financial crises. Um, this can be done without having to, uh, to eliminate banking entirely uh, or fractional reserve banking. It just, it just needs more regulation. It's much harder because of shadow banking. You have to find a way to uh, define what is banking. Uh, clearly, repo. Uh, uh, is, is playing much the same role in the modern system that deposits used to play. And so you have to find a way to extend it. Um, and we didn't do a great job in the, you know, Dodd-Frank is, uh, Dodd-Frank basically has a pornography standard for, for, for banking regulation. We, uh, how it, it, it has special regulation for systemically significant uh, institutions. And, how, and it says, well, how do we define that? Well, we'll, we'll know it when we see it, right? Uh, um, but that's a... Uh, but I think that's the answer. It's not that we need to, I mean, uh, you know, fractional. We're not, going, we're not going to go back to, uh, to the 17th century on, on banking. I, I, all I want us to do, actually, is to go back to the 1960s, right? It, it does, we don't need to go back that far. OK. So I'm back. Uh, hello. Um, I'm Cyril Viosa, uh, editor at European Tribune. Well, I think we should all be thankful for you banging on the drum for growth as opposed to fiscal austerity. Cause it's that's clear me, okay. an improvement and, and one that's been picked up by the, the French president. Still, um, is, should it really be the main target or should it not be clearly jobs, uh, which can be addressed sometimes with policies that might not help growth, such as a shorter work week or... Uh, helping processes that are more work intensive than energy intensive, uh, considering the level of inequality yeah. and environmental constraints, I would be far more scared of a um, of a jobless recovery than a, a full employment stagnation. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, better. 
I would argue to actually have the, uh, the, the economic growth, but sure. I mean, if we could find, I guess my question is how, how sustainable schemes like, like that are, but sure. Uh, and it was actually, we did, uh, uh, um, uh, the Kurzarbeit system in Germany does look like a success, although there are some questions about how important it was, various ways of trying to, to do uh, work sharing. They're, they're, I think they're very clearly second best, but, but second best is better than nothing at all. And, uh, and by the way, it was active. We, we actually, uh, we, I mean, the, uh, the uh, whatever you would call it, the, the, uh, uh, the loyal left economics opposition uh, uh, did, did actually try uh, a couple of times to persuade the Obama administration to go for, for uh, uh, limited forms of, of, of uh, job tax credits and, and so on without success. But sure, if that's, um, if, if we could get that, that would be, but I, I have to say, maybe I'm thinking most of the U.S. context where, where basically we can do so much just by restoring normal levels of, of state and local services. So it, it's, we don't even have to, do, we can basically, we, we, we basically, Rehire school teachers, and we get so much of the way. But, but if if we want to have private sector job sharing arrangements, that's um, I'm fine with that. I don't think it's my priority, but I'm fine with that too. And one final question here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, depression certainly, and recession or depression, whatever you call it, certainly is a huge problem for the world of today. Uh, but uh, fiscal irresponsibility also is a problem, uh, certainly in the periphery of Europe. Now, how do you reconcile fiscal responsibility and, and greater spending by the governments? That is, how do you, what you call, maintain some kind of fiscal discipline and yet reflate? Thank you. Okay. Okay. There's a story. It's one of those things, again, that people uh, stroke their beards, or, or their non-beards, actually. It's mostly people without beards who say this sort of thing. That people stroke their chins very wisely and say, oh, the trouble with, with stimulus is it never goes away, um, which is utterly not true, right? I mean, uh, certainly the U.S. stimulus went away way too soon. Uh, just no, no indication that, that, uh, that short-term measures to boost the economy do, in fact, tend to get built in as permanent measures. Didn't it, I, I'm actually not aware of any certainly nothing in U.S. history to suggest that that's true. The, the WPA did not persist after the Great Depression, right? The, 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 the stimulus measures, some, some government programs, but not, not things that are done for the purpose of fiscal stimulus. They don't go away. Uh, they, I mean, they, they don't persist. They tend to, to, to go away. And if we're looking, at, again, maybe it's U.S. experience. You know, people say, oh, politicians will squander. They, they will be irresponsible and run deficits even in good times. Um, that's way too generic. Uh, we actually um, we actually ran an extremely responsible fiscal policy uh, in uh, uh, for, for, uh, during most of the 1990s. Uh, we substantially reduced our debt to GDP ratio. We ran reasonably f uh, responsible fiscal policies in a number of earlier eras. Um, if we look, we seem to be in pretty good fiscal shape in, in the year 2000. Um, so it's not that politicians will squander, in the United States, it's not that politicians will squander surpluses. It is, uh, well, actually Republicans will squander, uh, right? It was, it was a very specific political thing. It wasn't this generic uh, politicians want to do giveaways. It was very specific, and it was actually with intent. Uh, to a large extent, you can say that the, the underlying theory of Star of the Beast was to deprive the government of revenue so that the next time the economy was in trouble, there would be strong pressure to cut uh, social programs. So if it's not, you know, if it's kind of generic, oh, we just, we just can't trust politicians, that's not right. It's, it, it, this really needs to be attributed to the, to the specific uh, uh, political dynamics. And I, I uh, there's, I, yeah, I, mean, I, I look here. I mean, it wasn't a, a, a spending stimulus, but there was a, uh, the principal stimulus measure such as it was here was the VAT cut. And um, that showed no, that, that went away too soon, not, not, not mm. uh, persisting. I don't, I don't think there's a, you know, this is, this is one of those stories that sounds like it's wise and based on the lessons of history, but is in fact just invented. It's not actually what, it's not, not what actually happens and certainly not relevant to the current debate. Okay, thank you very much. Well, there's no more time for questions. I'd like to remind everyone that there is a book sale and uh, signing poll will be there to sign books in the foyer. 
and it remains for me to thank you for an well, exceptionally thank interesting you. lecture. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good. So.